Good afternoon, everybody. At this time, will Sergeant Lugo please start his recording? Thank you. And at this time, will Sergeant Jones please start her opening statement? Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimonies, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation, and we are ready to begin. Is that my cue? All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Cohen, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today. I am joined by my colleagues on the committee. I think we have Councilmember Yeager, Kozlowitz, and Lander here so far. I know Councilmember Levine is here. Uh, today, we will be hearing testimony on intro number 2032, sponsored by myself by request of the mayor, and intro 2049, sponsored by Councilmember Levine. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> when the Department of Consumer Affairs was first codified as an agency in 1969, its focus was mainly ensuring that consumers were protected from shoddy business practices and exploitation. Over the years, however, the department's purpose has widened. For example, in 2015, Local Law 104 was enacted, which established the Office of Labor and Policy Standards, or OLPS. OLPS is housed within the department, and the council recently passed legislation officially changing the department's name to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protec Protections, DCWP, in recognition of the dual roles. DCWP is responsible for enforcing the city's various worker protection laws, including paid sick leave, uh, paid safe and sick, sick leave, fair work week, and, free, and the freelancer freelancer. <laughs> These laws offer New York City workers some of the strongest protections available. Previously, the city's paid safe and sick laws were also more comprehensive than current state laws. However, on September 30th of this year, New York State's new sick leave law will go into effect. While the aim of the law is similar to New York City's law, some of the provisions exceed the protections afforded in the local law. Therefore, the purpose of intro 2032 is to bring the city's law into line with the new changes at the state level. If enacted, 2032 would require employees, uh, employers of five or more employees, one or more domestic worker, or four or more employees with a net income of more than $1 million uh, to provide 40 hours of paid sick leave. Did I read that last part right? or four or more employees and with, not the employees don't have a net income of more than 4 million, but the employer does, to provide 40 hours of paid safe and sick leave to their workers. Under the existing New York City law, such payments are generally only provided to workplaces with five or more employees. Furthermore, intro 2032 would require employers with four or, more, or fewer employees and an income of less than 1 million to provide 40 hours of unpaid leave However, it would also require New York City employers with 100 or more employees to provide those workers with 56 hours of paid safe and sick leave up from 40 hours. Other provisions of the bill include providing employees with written notice of their leave entitlements, updates to the definitions of domestic worker and safe leave, and authority for Corporation Council to bring a civil action against an employer who is engaged in a pattern and practice of violation. Finally, the bill also eliminates the 120 day waiting period and instead allows employees to use their sick and safe leave as soon as it is accrued. In conjunction with intro 2032 today, we are also hearing testimony on intro 2049, sponsored by Council Member Levine. This bill seeks to establish specific protections for hotel workers. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit all industries and workers hard, but some have been so devastated that it is difficult to imagine how they will recover, even after the global emergency is over. The city's hotel industry is one example. 
In normal times, New York City is a mecca for tourists. Over the last 10 years, the number of visitors to the city has increased exponentially. And last year, there were a record 67 million visitors. However, with COVID-19 restrictions forcing people to stay home, the city's tourism industry has diminished substantially and the hotel industry is bearing much of the brunt. Prior to the pandemic, New York City had 703 hotels operating approximately 138,000 rooms in an industry that employed an estimated 300,000 workers. At the peak of the pandemic though, during late March and April, nine in 10 hotels furloughed their workers and nationally 7.5 million industry jobs were lost. Although things have improved slightly, by August, over half the industry's hotel workers had still not been reinstated. With the city's hotel occupancy rates still way below normal trends. For example, in the last week of August, they were down, they were down a whopping 72%. The outlook for the city's hotel industry and workers are, is bleak. Typically, hotelers need an occupancy rate of about 50% if they have any likelihood of breaking even. Hence, even if hotelers are able to stay afloat, there are serious concerns that they will be forced into bankruptcy or sell up. While this may provide relief for the individual hoteler, this puts the hotel worker in a precarious state with little to no guarantees regarding the security of their job, let alone their wages, benefits and their wages, benefits, and working conditions. Intro 2049 attempts to provide some assurance by granting hotel workers basic rights should their employer sell their hotel. For instance, under intro 2049, once new ownership commences, the new hotel must provide employment to existing hotel workers for at least 90 days. Furthermore, the conditions of this employment must be at least the same as the conditions provided by the previous hotel owner. If the new ownership determines that they do not need all the existing hotel workers, then they must select existing workers for employment pursuant to the terms of their collective bargaining agreement or by seniority and experience. At the end of the 90 day period, the new employer is required to perform a written evaluation of the worker. And if the worker receives a satisfactory result, the new employer must offer them continued employment under the conditions set by the previous employer. If enacted, Intro 2049 will also provide additional protections for consumers by requiring hotelers to provide their customers with at least 24 hours notice if there are disruptions to service. This includes services such as Wi-Fi, in-room appliances, on-site amenities, and construction noise. If the hotelers do not provide this notice, they can be required to refund the consumer's charges, or they may face fines of up to $500 for the first offense and up to $5,000 for subsequent offenses within a two year period. We know that the whole hotel industry will face ongoing pressure as it recovers from the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. But intro 2049 ensures that hotel workers are not forced to pay the price for this recovery. I'd like to now hand uh, the Zoom over to Council Member Levine to make further statements on this important bill. Thank you so much, Chair Cohen for your leadership on behalf of consumers and workers and for pushing this legislation forward for hearing today. And I do wanna say a few words on intro 2049. Uh, I'm gonna start by acknowledging that there just are few sectors in New York City that have endured a more crushing blow during this pandemic than the hospitality industry. With tourism almost completely drying up, hotel occupancy is now lower than it's ever been in modern history worse even than the aftermath of 9-11 or the 2008 financial crisis. This has directly impacted tens of thousands of New Yorkers who rely on this industry for their livelihoods. Hotel housekeepers, bartenders, concierges, banquet servers, and so many others who have worked in this industry for in some cases decades, but have now been out of work since March. Now the hospitality industry of this city will eventually come back. It won't be quick. It won't be easy, but tourists will return, drawn to all the things that make us a world-class destination. We need to take action now to ensure that that rebound happens in a way that is fair for workers and fair for guests, because doing so will ultimately only strengthen the industry and our city. These are the goals of Intro 2049. 
First, the bill puts in place protections for workers in the event of a change in hotel ownership, prohibiting hotels from firing workers without cause for their first 90 days back on the job, and ensuring that any hotel workers that are denied their rights under the law would be able to pursue action against their employer and collect back pay. These rules are common sense. Hotel workers have served as the face of our city to millions of visitors year after year. It's only fair that we have their backs during this difficult time by ensuring them a path back to their jobs. In putting such protections in place, New York will be following the lead of many other cities around the nation that have already adopted similar measures. Washington DC, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Newark, and others. Secondly, Intro 2049 would provide additional rights to hotel guests. When travelers book hotel rooms here, they need to have the confidence that they will receive the hotel experience they were promised when they made their reservations. So our legislation would require hotels to notify customers in advance about disruptions that could impact their stay, including loud construction, vermin infestations, closed amenities and services, closed accessibility features, and strikes. When any of these disruptions occur, hotels would also be required to offer guests the chance to cancel without pen penalty. When this pandemic finally recedes, we want visitors to be able to hotels that are responsibly and fairly managed and operated. Travelers deserve to know that New York City's hotels will either provide them with what they were promised or will offer them cancellation and a refund if that's not possible. Offering such a guarantee will remove uncertainty for tourists and will send a strong message to visitors from around the world that New York City is a dependable, worthwhile destination. Here again, New York would be catching up with other cities around the country that have already enacted similar protections for guests, including Albany, Newark, Secaucus, and North Bergen. I am thrilled that no fewer than 23 of our colleagues have signed on as co-sponsors of Intro 2049, and I look forward to an informative discussion today on this critical topic. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, I wanna acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Chin, uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn the Zoom over to the Committee Council uh, for some procedural items and uh, the Administer of the Oath of the First Panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I am Belkis Meharic, Senior Counsel to the Consumer Affairs Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I'll be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be the Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, Laura Lay Salas. I will call on you shortly when it's time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of question for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participant, participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call on Commissioner Salas to testify. For questions, we'll be joined by Deputy Commissioner Ben Holt from the Office of Labor and Policy Standards at DCWP and Stephen Etanani Executive Director for External Affairs, DCW, DCWP. Before we begin, I'll administer the oath. I'll call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, mm -hmm. before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Salas. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Halt. I do. Thank you. Stephen Eknani. I do. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. You may begin your testimony um, when you're ready. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chair Cohen and members of this committee. I am Lorelei Salas, Commissioner for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. And to all the attendees, the participants today, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. Um, I am joined, as you mentioned, uh, by Ben Holt and Steve Etanani, my colleagues at the department. Um, and I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on introductions 2032 and 2049 relating to the city's paid safe and sick leave law and the hotel industry. Before I discuss the bills before the committee today, I'd be remiss not to mention that this is the department's first hearing before the council since the passage of introduction 1609. Intro 1609, now local law 80 of 2020, officially changed the department's name from the Department of Consumer Affairs to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Our new name more accurately reflects the scope of our work to both enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers and serve as a central resource for workers. Local Law 80 also clarified several department authorities, including our ability to seek and secure restitution for New Yorkers across our laws and rules. Especially in these uncertain times, how we present and execute department services matters. Thank you again for passing this very important piece of legislation. New York City's paid safe and sick leave law remains a fundamental part of the department's worker protection mandate. Since February, for example, DCWP has secured more than $350,000 in restitution via paid safe and sick leave law for approximately 900 workers. The protections afforded by this law empower workers to take care of themselves and their loved ones without the risk of losing their jobs. Especially important during COVID-19, the law gives New York City workers the right to immediately ask for and receive the time off they've earned. By allowing employees to stay home when they're sick, this law serves to not only protect covered employees, but also employers, co-workers, consumers, and other members of the public from being exposed to this novel virus. New York City's paid safe and sick leave law works. And over the years, the city council has strengthened the law so as to broaden its commitment to working New Yorkers. In 2014, the law was expanded to increase the scope of covered employees entitled to paid sick leave. In 2018, the law expanded coverage to include paid leave to obtain services for or to protect oneself against acts of domestic violence, unwanted sexual conduct, contact, stalking, and human trafficking. Introduction 2032 before the committee today will represent another important step in the evolution of this law. On April 3rd, Governor Cuomo signed a statewide permanent paid sick leave law enacted as part of the executive budget. The new law establishes several baseline requirements for employers to provide paid or unpaid leave to their employees. While the state law provides that New York City can enact and enforce local paid sick leave laws, it also mandates minimum baseline requirements for such city laws. Accordingly, Intro 2032 updates the city's law to align with the new state labor law. These updates include, but are not limited to increasing the amount of paid leave to 56 hours from 40 hours provided to employees at businesses with 100 or more employees, making paid leave of 40 hours available to employers of small, employees of smaller employers that have a net income of $1 million or more and eliminating uh, the 120 day waiting period before new employees can start using their accrued leave. In addition to promoting consistency with state law, Intro 2032 clarifies DCWP's authority and notably modernizes standards and protections. For example, Intro 2032 allows domestic workers to accrue their safe and sick time at the same rate as other employees in the city. As a former paid care worker myself, this is personal. We believe it is long overdue that this dedicated constituency, one that is continually called upon to serve in times of great need, receive the same benefits afforded to other workers. 
we strongly urge the passage of introduction 2032 before the September 30th effective date of the state law. The second piece of legislation before the committee today, intro 2049, seeks to remedy consumer and worker protection concerns in the hotel industry. The legislation both provides remedies for displaced hotel service workers and provides hotel guests with enumerated consumer protections. The CWP's Office of Labor Policy and Standards promotes approaches that create fair workplaces. As a matter of principle, an employer should consider every option to retain, promote, and empower employees. While there are circumstances that may necessitate personnel changes at a business, best practices such as reasonable notice, transparency, and consistency are paramount to worker protection. Laying of workers should always be an option of last resort, and a change of ownership alone should not warrant immediate or unsubstantiated job loss. DCWP supports the intent of the hotel service worker retention provisions of this bill. Likewise, DCWP supports the intent of enhancing consumer protections for guests affected by hotel service disruptions. No person or entity should willingly or knowingly misrepresent the sales of services to consumers. Our department's foundational statute, the New York City Consumer Protection Law, enshrines this sentiment by prohibiting deceptive or unconscionable trade practices. As currently drafted, intro 2049 would require additional departmental resources to handle the intake and mediation of consumer complaints. According to a 2016 New York State Controller Report, New York City is the third largest hotel market in the nation with nearly 700 hotels citywide and thousands of rooms. As such, the breadth of the enforcement mandate could pose a strain on existing department resources. In addition, we anticipate that there will be discussions at a staff level concerning any legal issues that may be implicated by this bill. Once again, thank you, Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. It's good to see you, Commissioner. I hope you're uh, Thank you, great to see you too. I'm actually going to turn it over to Levine for the round of questions. I think we've been joined by Council Member Yeager also. Um, but Mark, I'm going to give it to you first, all right? Get Mark. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. It's great to see you. And I, I do want to ask you some follow-up questions related to uh, the administration's position on intro 2049. I appreciate that you have expressed support for the intent of the provisions of the legislation. I just want to understand a little bit more areas where you might have concerns. It sounds like principally it is, it's practical and a question of resources in, um, in, in uh, serving to mediate consumer disputes. Uh, particularly related to um, provision of, of promised services. Uh, could you explain more about the resources that you think uh, would be needed to fairly implement this and why you're concerned that they would be uh, overly burdensome? Yes, thank you for the question. And I, I hope you're doing well, uh, Council Member Levine. Um, yes, thank you. So uh, yes, I mean, uh, really it's just a matter of, of, of resources for us. Um, we have, you know, obviously we're um, experiencing a financial crisis still in the city that's affecting everyone, including our city services, right? Um, so we understand um, that, uh, you know, uh, additional resources may not always be possible. It isn't work that we currently do. We, um, we typically get complaints from, uh, workers, um, employees of hotels and consumers of hotels, but uh, for, in order to mediate complaints from consumers, um, usually it has been cases in which there's a clear overcharge um, of, um, a, of a consumer. And in those, those are not the types of cases that this bill envisions. So it would be definitely additional work um, that may just put a strain on 
on our resources and may also increase the lag time in terms of complaint response for consumers. Just to piggyback on what the commissioner uh, mentioned, I would say that in terms of consumer complaints regarding service disruptions, consumers don't come to DCWP for that for that kind of issue. It's not something that consumers think of um, in our agency as a, as a resource. Um, and just the nature of the complaints that we would receive, um, and as this bill contemplates, mediation would be the way that we would kind of um, engage enforcement in this sense. That means fact finding, talking with the consumer, and then having a process of uh, discussing the issue with, with the, with the uh, hotel in this case. Well, look, mediating in such situations is squarely within the mission of the agency. And the philosophy here is that the resources that you put in um, ultimately give the consumer more confidence and, and therefore really strengthen the sector, strengthen the economy, because uh, for, for, for business to work, people have to have a level of trust. So uh, philosophically, I can't imagine there's an objection to um, you investing some resources to ensure that consumers get uh, the kind of confidence they need when they rent a hotel room. Uh, have, have you uh, priced out uh, the kind of financial impact you believe this would uh, impose on the agency? Um, no, for, first to address your point, we, we certainly um, support the intent of the legislation, right? It's very much in line with our mission to make sure that consumers are, don't fall prey to deceptive practices. And also the, the goal of providing workers with some, some transition time, uh, some stability and predictability in terms of their employment is also another goal that we support. Um, so we have not priced out what it would cost to, to support a, a program of mediation for this new type of complaints. Uh, and I understand that the law department is still, you know, looking at the language of the legislation. So until we have a more clear idea of what that looks like, then we'll be able to price it out. And regarding the worker protections, do you have similar concerns about the cost of meeting meeting those disputes? It, my understanding, as as drafted, the language of the legislation provides for a, a private right of action for the workers affected by any violations right. of the it law, does. and in that case, it wouldn't really um, impact our operations. Um, that, that, and, that, that's good to hear. And and uh, finally, uh, you raised in your statement, uh, and, and you alluded to now, uh, possible legal problems. Are you aware of any, or are you simply being cautious at this point? I, you know, my, my our colleagues at the law department are currently reviewing the language, so I I don't have any any details to add to that. Um, but I believe that they'll be having further discussions with the council. Okay, uh, I'll wrap up and I'll say, look, I, I truly appreciate your support of the intent of the key provisions of this bill. And uh, will reiterate my feeling that uh, the fact that you'd have to have some resources in place to put this into practice uh, simply means that uh, it would be the agency doing its mission for an important public purpose. Uh, so we, we look forward to having ongoing dialogue with you. Um, but again, thank you for your broad expressions of support of the intent of this legislation. And I'll pass it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Levine. Uh, Commissioner, I just uh, I'm wondering, uh, I know that you know, the agency recently uh, brought an action against a, um, um, uh, against a, a supermarket in my district. Is, is, is the regimen here, the, the, the way this is going to be laid out, is it substantially different uh, than the protections we offer for uh, supermarket employees? So, uh, yes, thank you for bringing that up and also for all your advocacy on behalf of those workers. Uh, for those who don't know about this case, it's a case uh, of a key food supermarket in the Bronx that fired 21 workers overnight uh, on a change of ownership, um, which is a, a similar um, issue that this particular legislation we're discussing today is trying to solve. Um, in the Grocery Worker Retention Act, um, again, workers are given a 90-day uh, transition period when there's a new owner that comes into the business. Um, and that allows for both um, 
an opportunity for the business to evaluate their needs going forward and evaluate the skills and experience of the current employees and the employees also have a chance to be you know to show that they, they know how to do their work and uh, and if they're not retained, at least they have three months to look for some other employment. So we're, um, we're suing that particular business because um, they're in violation of the law in place. And so um, Intro 2049 has uh, similar goals to provide some predictability um, uh, and protections against the volatility that workers are facing in this industry. Uh, and that is why we generally support the intent of this legislation too. Uh, but it, it, it works similarly in terms of dispute resolution or it's different? Um, well, so for the uh, Grocery Work and Retention Act, my agency actually has enforcement authority um, and we are um, able to take complaints from the workers with respect to this retention period. Um, and, and so in this case, we, we were able to start an investigation and then um, uh, seek to impose fines to the employer if they do not come to their senses and start complying with the law. Uh, just for one second, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Brennan and Koo. Um, but again, do, doesn't this place like less of a burden on your agency creating the private cause of action? Um, Oh, absolutely. If uh, workers are able to pursue their rights in court, um, um, yes, with respect to that dispute, the dispute of, you know, I was not given my three month transition period or retention period. Yes, workers can pursue their rights in court uh, privately. Uh, with respect to their, the consumer complaint, though, uh, the language is drafted that indicates that we would be mediating those uh, complaints. Okay, can you, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that portion of legislation too. I was wondering, could you, I, I don't know, um, in, in terms of complaints, uh, does your agency have a track record of, of taking a lot of complaints from consumers in the hotel industry? So um, as I mentioned just briefly, um, we do get complaints from workers employed at hotels for, um, in cases that involve, for instance, the paid safe and sick leave law, right? That is the kind of uh, uh, typical case, I guess, uh, for, for a, a worker that comes forward to our agency. Um, we've had about 45 uh, of those types of complaints uh, from hotel workers uh, recently. And, uh, for consumers, um, it's been, um, well, we do get calls from every type of complaint from consumers. Um, the majority of those complaints are not complaints that my office uh, has jurisdiction over. Um, you know, if there is a clear violation of our consumer protection law, we will definitely, you know, take those on. But that's a very small segment of the kinds of complaints we receive right now. Um, hotel consumers. Most of those are referred out to the Attorney General's office, as Steve mentioned, um, because we don't, because they have broader authority right now, right? Um, so I believe we've handled a handful of consumer complaints regarding hotels, maybe less than a, less than a dozen. So I think, you know, just to, to punctuate what the commissioner is saying, as it relates specifically to this bill and service disruptions, we do not receive uh, many, if at all, any complaints uh, from hotel guests. So um, when we're talking about a resource concern and, and our mediation, while we agree with council member Levine that that does fall within the broader uh, mission of the agency and is reflective of why we're supportive of the intents of the bill, um, there is a distinct and very real uh, reality that um, expanding our, our authority to discreetly um, handle this consumer protection will lead to an increase of consumer complaints and intake and mediation for our agency. There are tens of thousands of rooms, hotel rooms in, in New York City. The scope of the legislation and how they define service disruptions from anything um, to include uh, if a room advertises a, ref a, a, a mini fridge in there and it not being there to larger uh, you know, arguably larger disruptions, including construction or even um, uh, picketing by workers, um, it would lead to an influx of, of uh, I, complaints coming into our agency. I'm not 100% sure this is a fair question, but 
in in the current in the, in the way the law is now, I go to a hotel. Um, you know, their website has this beautiful pool. The pool's closed. What is my recourse at the moment? When you get there and there is no pool, yes, um, we would have to look at what kinds of disclosures uh, you relied on, right? I mean, I think just saying to us, you saw a pool on the website. If there's no clear uh, statement from the hotel that you have access to the swimming pool, and I, I don't even know that you would have uh, a remedy there. Um, but I, I'm not, um, you know, it's something that we would have to evaluate and see. Um, so like I said, typically the, the kinds of cases that our mediators are, are usually taking on are cases in which there's a clear overcharge or um, um, something where like you enter into some kind of a service agreement um, and there's a clear, um, uh, you basically, you didn't get exactly what you paid for, but it's very explicit, you know, what the terms are, right? The terms have to be very explicit. So I, you know, in that situation, I think it would depend um, how explicit the terms were. And I, I think like what we're saying right now is that many of these cases, uh, our current practice today is to work with the attorney general's office and to have those uh, referred out to them. Is and again, I, I realize I'm asking a slightly difficult question only because it, it, it's not uh, sort of central to what you're doing presently. But if, in other words, if I am a consumer, and again, whether you know whether it's a pool, you know, it, you know the advertising. If, if the advertising was, from my perspective, deceptive, you know that I thought I was uh, staying at the Ritz, and when I got there, it was not the Ritz. Um, you would, in all likelihood, you would. Uh, refer me to the uh, attorney general ultimately you think I mean I, I think it depends this we definitely you know our law does cover deceptive advertising right um, but I guess I was just going to to the issue of um, whether you know what what is it that you actually thought you were buying and what representations were made to you as the consumer right um, so um, I don't know, honestly, to, to be honest, I'm not sure if under the law it would be recognized just seeing a pool on a website is enough of a representation, but um, so, yeah. I so mean, we depends. can both agree that like if you're a, a, a business traveler and you get to the hotel and there's no Wi-Fi, I mean, that could really be, that that's not incidental to your experience, even though people think of a hotel room, they think of four walls. But if I'm there because I have to work and I, you know, and particularly in an age of COVID, if I don't have Wi-Fi, I, I, you know, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so frankly, I mean, I think that there could be a lot of type, consumer complaint types that we would be like, uh, if we had the resources, like able to investigate and take on. Uh, I think also uh, at times we've made decisions about um, just because of resources and operations as to what types of complaints we'll be able to dig in on and whatnot, right? Um, and if we have an enforcement agency that, um, you know, has a focus on the hotel industry, for instance, then we, necessar we wouldn't necessarily also try to duplicate resources or efforts um, in that. Um, so, so it depends. Yeah. And I think like, you know, I, and Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, the questions. I think that the hypotheticals are kind of a dangerous realm for us. I think really when we pursue, as the commissioner said, when we pursue cases, uh, particularly if, if they fall under our, our current consumer protection law, it's a very broad law. Um, it's really on a case by case basis, um, what information is furnished to us. And then of course, there is a matter of discretion in terms of the commissioner and the, and the agency by and large, in terms of like pattern and practice. Do we have uh, a series, for example, of, of uh, complaints that fall into a certain um, you know, pattern and that may also be a consideration of, of how we um, allocate resources. But it's hard to say broadly without those specifics um, of the case, what, what would and would not fall under our current purview. You would, and just so from my own understanding, so, sort of dividing it into silos of an individual complaint. I got there and the hotel normally you know, has a good reputation, does provide what they advertise they provide. But if it's a one-off 
the kind of complaint, there might be a, another remedy other than going to the agency. Whereas if there's a hotel in Times Square that's, that's business practices primarily involves ripping off tourists in a systematic way, you might take that up more readily. I don't think we get those complaints right now is what we're saying. Like we, I don't even want to suggest or assume that a complaint uh, related to service disruption is before the agency. So okay. that premise is important to know. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to ask Balkis. I, I don't know if I know who has their hand up, if uh, colleagues have questions. Yes. Um, I'm going to turn it back to you. Too. I'll, now, I'll now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. The sergeant at arms, um, sorry. Uh, you should begin once I've called on you and the sergeant can announce that you may begin. I, I believe um, Councilmember Lander had a question. I'm not sure if he still has one. Maybe not. It looks like we don't have any questions from council members. So unless uh, please, I just got to follow up, then I have one more. I, okay. Again, maybe just to make sure that I clearly understand um, the the portion of this uh, of twenty forty nine related to uh, consumer complaints. Is it that you, you don't you don't think it's an issue? Like it's a it's a it's a remedy without a problem, like a, a piece of legislation solving to trying to solve a problem that's not existing, or you just don't know if it's existing. No, we're not, uh, by no means, we're not saying that this issue does not exist, right? Uh, I think what we're saying is that uh, we, it's not the kind of complaint that has usually come to us, uh, um, but even when complaints have come to us, we've uh, focused our resources on the types of cases that are very clear cut for us, like overcharging consumers. Um, so, but we don't wanna say that it's not an issue. Um, and uh, we believe that a, a lot of these types of cases, when we've gotten them in the past, we refer them out to the AG's office. Okay, I understand. All right. Uh, so, Bakis, I just want to be clear. We have no more questions for the for the admin. I don't see any questions. Okay, Commissioner, it's good to see you. I appreciate uh, uh, your testimony this morning, this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'd now like to begin the public testimony portion of the hearing. I'd like to remind everyone, unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant of Arms will give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin. I would now like to welcome Sherry Lewent from A Better Balance, followed by Bav Tiberwal and Marissa Centeno. Sherry? Um. Yeah, do I need to wait for the Sergeant at Arms? You may begin. Thank you. Um, thank you. My name is Sherry Lewant, and I'm co president and co founder of A Better Balance, which is a legal nonprofit that helps working men and women take care of themselves and their families without compromising their economic security. Um, in 2013, we helped draft and negotiate the Paid Sick Days Bill that became law in April of 2014 giving millions of New Yorkers the right to paid sick time. Um, and more recently, we worked with the governor's office to secure statewide paid sick time uh, for all workers in the state of New York. The law we helped pass at the state level um, is um, in April uh, is um, a little stronger in some respects um, than the paid sick time legislation that we have in, here in the city that has been amended several times and is a very strong law. Um, but the purpose of the legislation currently proposed here is to ensure that the city law is consistent with the state law 
because the state law provides that the city law can only be enforced by the city if it meets or exceeds the requirements of the state. So um, we, uh, at A Better Balance, want to take this occasion to applaud the Department of Consumer Affairs for their commitment to robust enforcement of the city's paid sick time law. Um, and it's imperative that the Department of Consumer Affairs be able to continue to enforce the city's law. Um, to ensure that happens, the city council must pass intro 2032-2020 to bring the city law into line with the new state sick time law. And I wanna make the point that the need to conform to state law is not the only reason to pass these amendments. Uh, some of the changes um, here uh, were in the original proposed paid sick time law, but needed to be negotiated out due to the hostility at the time of the then mayor and then city council president. And in the course of the last six years, and particularly in the last six months, as paid sick time has become even more important to all of us here in the city, We've learned that many of these proposed changes are necessary to make the law even more effective in protecting the city's health. The immediate use of paid sick time is an example of that um, instead of a 120 day waiting period, as is the expansion of coverage for domestic workers. So we're delighted with the amendments to the New York City paid sick time law, which are before you. Um, they're well drafted and they bring the city into compliance with state law. We had, a, uh, we had two suggestions for technical amendments, um, one around um, the domestic worker improvements. Um, the definition now in the uh, proposed would exclude domestic workers who are um, working for agencies from the definition of domestic workers, but the way that's worded, um, there's some ambigu ambiguity as to whether those workers are covered at all. So um, we had some just suggested language um, to clarify that they are covered and to also clarify that in those situations, it's a joint employment situation and both the agency and the placement are responsible. Um, that language is in my written testimony. And we'd also like to strike the provision at 20-924.13 that indicates that only the Corporation Council can bring a legal action under the New York City's sick time law. Um, we expect that workers will be able to bring private civil actions under the state paid sick time, time law. And so we don't wanna um, have anything in this law that would prevent them from doing so. So we'd like to see the um, three in there struck. So um, that's all I have. Um, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony and um, for your consideration of these excellent amendments and um, for all the work the city council has done to support sick, paid sick time in the city of New York. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. As I don't see any council member questions, we'll move on to the next witness. We have Bav Tipperwall, followed by Marissa Centeno, followed by Troy Flanagan. Bav, you may begin your testimony when ready. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, we can hear you, thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Chairman Cohen and members of the the committee. Uh, I'm, I'm here to speak to intro 2049. Uh, my name is Bob Tiberwall and I'm here on behalf of the Hotel Trades Council, the union whose 40,000 members work in the hotels across our city. These hardworking women and men are the backbone of the city's hospitality industry, which is a key driver of New York City's economy. During these uncertain times, spurred by an unprecedented pandemic, it's more important than ever that hotel workers' jobs are protected in the event of control of a hotel. Many hotels are bound to close during the um, COVID-19 crisis, and many of them are gonna reopen most likely under new ownership and management. So this bill is critical in preserving and protecting good middle-class hotel jobs by preventing workers from being unreasonably fired. The bill goes further and also grants workers strong recourse from wrongful terminations. Without this bill, we're, uh, we fear that many hardworking New Yorkers will lose good jobs and will have little to no recourse from unjust termination. Additionally, we support the provisions of the bill that also protect consumers from service disruptions during their stay in the city. We believe that this bill grants reasonable protections for visitors to New York that ensure their stay in our city is a pleasant one. We think it's incumbent on hotels to inform guests of any service disruptions and that those guests have the right to avoid those disruptions. This bill achieves that and it also helps with the Accommodations option. So thank you for your 
Sorry, Bev, you're cutting off. Can you hear us? I, I can. Um, I, I don't know how much of that you, you missed or, or didn't. Um, maybe, I'll, I'll, maybe go I'll back to the sentence. Three sentences. Okay, sure. Um, uh, so I was saying we, we also support, uh, support the provisions of the bill that protect consumers from service disruptions. And we th think uh, it's incumbent on hotels to inform guests of service disruptions and that those guests have the right to avoid those disruptions. This bill achieves that and it helps promote the city's hotel accommodations as re reliable options for future travel. Thank you. Well, Keith, I, I have a question actually. Thank you. It's, it's good to see you and thank you for your testimony. Sure. Um, I, I am con uh, interested in, is there like a, a data-driven basis for your support on the consumer protections? Do, do your members like, is there any way to know if your members have, or if in, in terms of consumers not getting the, 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 you know, the benefit of their bargain, what they had hoped to get? I'm, I'm, I understand that your, your members obviously can see what's going on on the ground, but is there any way that that's sort of codified or there, there's some data that would suggest that this is a significant problem? Uh, I, I don't have data for you on that right now. I would just say that we I, we don't believe there's recourse right now, uh, uh, and that this bill would provide that recourse for for people who who did experience those disruptions in a way that they don't have access to today. And, and we support that provision. Do you believe it's a significant problem, though? I guess is what I'm trying to find out. Is it widespread? Uh, we do. We do, and it's and, and especially in the context of, of hotels beginning to reopen in the course of the uh, after the pandemic, uh, we think it's extremely important that it that it be on the books. So, is it is it that, that you're concerned about sort of in a post COVID world, a hotel might not offer the same amenities that it offered? Like obviously, you know, uh, like being able to use the hotel gym and all that. Like, is it COVID related, or or was pre-COVID, do you think that the industry had a significant problem in sort of overselling and under-delivering in terms of amenities? Certainly more so after, after COVID. Um, I think our main, our main interest in that provision has to do with, um, you know, we want to make sure that accommodations in New York are, are viewed as, as, as reliable and dependable for people who are interested in treating New York City as a destination that they choose to, to book, travel to, and stay in. Obviously, you have a, you know, a meaningful investment in the health of the industry. And so, I mean, that's really, I guess, what your, your point of view is that you think that having these consumer uh, protections will support the industry's reputation and allow it to recover. That's right. And, and you know, the hotels are, are a, a unique type of service and that you know you've got thousands you've got millions of people who come every year to new york city's hotels who who really come and and use uh these facilities and, and off here so certainly in the context of covid we want them to feel confident in 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 taking that leap of faith and and booking that travel and Okay, I, I appreciate your testimony. Balki, so I don't know if anybody else has, oh, there, there are yes, hands. Yes, we right. do. Yes, we have um, Council Member Levine has a question followed by Council Member Chen. Council Member Levine. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Bob. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the threat of hotel ownership changing and new management uh, attempting to treat existing workers unfairly is not just hypothetical. This has happened in New York City, even in um, more prosperous times. Uh, there was a very notorious case uh, late in 2019, a hotel owner by the name of Sam Chang, Sam Chang, who acquired, who acquired the club quarters downtown, uh, engaged in some pretty bad anti-worker actions. 
Can you say anything more about either that case or others like it that, that gave you cause for concern about what happens when ownership changes? Yeah, 100%. Um, uh, look, even in, even in the best of times, uh, this occurring, you know, this, this is a serious threat to our members is where hotels are sold um, from one owner to another or, or management. Seems like we may have lost you. Bav, it might help to turn off your video. Bav, are you still there? Looks like we lost him. Let's see if he comes back. He might be logging in. All right, in that case, um, Councilmember Chin, was your question for Bav, the, for, the, for the witness? Okay, then we'll move to the next, um, the next witness and we'll go back to Bav um, if he comes back. The next, the next witness is Marissa Santino, followed by Troy Flanagan, followed by Richard Bourne. Marissa, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon and thank you. My name is Marissa Santino and I am the New York co-director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance. I also act as the coordinator for the New York Domestic Workers Coalition. So I'd like to thank the committee chair, um, Council Member Cohen and bill sponsors, um, Council Member Kalos for introducing uh, Bill Intro 2032 um, in its intent to update the current New York City paid sick and safe leave. So our coalition and members are especially interested in having this bill brought to a vote so that over the over 250,000 domestic workers in the city and in particular the 60,000 domestic workers that work in private homes have full access to the benefits and intent of paid uh, safe and sick leave. Um, National Domestic Workers Alliance is the leading voice for dignity and fairness of the over 2.5 million domestic workers in the United States. And I just wanted to um, comment that uh, to comment that in 2010, New York State uh, passed its very first bill, uh, bill of domestic worker rights, the first of its kind in the country. Um, and this year, 2020, marks its 10 year anniversary. Um, it's a bittersweet anniversary knowing that we've come so far since the initial signing of this historic law, yet the pandemic has shed a bright spotlight on how much further we have to go. Currently, um, the two days of paid safe and sick leave which domestic workers are allotted in the city for domestic workers is wholly inadequate. Um, we know that it was a very progressive decision to include domestic workers in the paid safe and sick leave law um, in New York City at the time. And so we commend the city council for having made it possible for domestic workers to have access um, to paid safe and sick leave. Unfortunately, the effects of having two days with the city and three days with the state create a confusing system of paid sick leave that results in domestic workers not actually being able to access and use these days as intended. It was confusing, it's confusing for domestic workers, employers, and at times even the enforcing entities to both educate and adjudicate um, these much needed provisions of the labor law. Uh, the need to wait for a full year to use your sick days meant that domestic workers were getting fired time and time again for taking the much needed days um, only to have to start over from zero the next time around. And domestic workers find themselves having to choose um, which uh, enforcing entity or agency to which to pursue their claims. And most often paid sick leave was left on the table in order to pursue perhaps a higher claim with the Department of Labor for wage theft. Um, when originally passed the uh, Bill of Rights, it was sort of ahead of its time in offering the three days off um, because no one had days off at that time. Um, and so it kind of like opened the door for um, New York City to be able to model and create um, its really progressive and um, overwhelmingly um, uh, positive effects for um, workers across the city. 
And so what we are uh, want to just really stress is that domestic workers need, uh, do need and deserve to have uh, paid sick days um, on, on par with everyone else in the city. Um, they are essential workers. Uh, when the governor passed the paid uh, sick days law, domestic workers were once, once again excluded from having um, the full rights and benefits of paid uh, sick days. Um, even though they are deemed essential workers because they are classified as childcare workers and as caregivers in the city. Um, we know that the pandemic uh, effects of the pandemic was swift and severe on the domestic worker industry and having access for access to um, the paid safe and sick leave law um, with uh, immediate access to being able to take their sick days, not only benefits domestic workers, but it also benefits those that rely so much on the care work of domestic workers across the city. Um, they are the work that is, we are in like a care crisis in this moment, it became blaringly obvious when um, no one was able to send their children to school um, and uh, uh, people who needed care relied upon the life-giving care that domestic workers provide. Um, but it also means that they also need to be provided with the same essential um, basic um, labor protection such as paid safe and sick leave, um, especially at the full benefits of five days. Um, what I just wanted to um, state is that we do have some recommendations around uh, um, definitions in the language itself, which is in my uh, written testimony. Um, and we wanted to make sure that um, domestic workers are able to access the paid safe and sick leave law before the state actually goes into effect um, uh, on September 30th as well. Uh, domestic workers, we're in a trifecta of a hurricane in this regard. They are mostly uh, women of color. Um, that means that um, we were dealing with um, uh, the care crisis of the economic uh, fallout. We're dealing with the health crisis of COVID-19 and we were dealing with uh, um, racism of, of, and violent acts against people of color in this country um, at the time and so having these uh, benefits to be able to shore up domestic work is actually really crucial to not only the industry, but to the economy at large. Um, and you can read some more details about the effects of uh, the pandemic um, in my testimony. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much. And we uh, really um, um, commend the city council um, and the committee for bringing this issue forward today. Thank you, Marissa. Um, if there are questions for you, we'll hold those for now. We're gonna go back to Bav um, and unmute him and council member Chin. You may have been finishing your answer for council member Levine, but I'm not sure if he's still here. Um, but council member Chin had a question for you. Sure, and I apologize. I've moved to a, a better internet part of my my house here. Thank you. Council member. Levine. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, oh. he, he got cut off. Council member Levine, did you have any follow up questions before you finished? I, yeah, I think you were asking about about um, uh, have we had have we seen cases and are we particularly concerned about cases where there's a change in ownership and people's jobs are in jeopardy as a result of that? Is that right, council member? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, so, uh, so yes, absolutely. We've even in the best of times, it's it's a threat and, and a constant threat to our to our members, and we we know we know um, how how fickle real estate can can be, especially um, where we have a lot of hotels in Manhattan, and and we've seen situations where where there's been a change in ownership that's been a direct threat to our members, um, and and especially now, and if that, that's in the best of times, especially now. Um, like I said earlier, you know, we're expecting a lot of these hotels, unfortunately, to close uh, and, the, and even ones that don't exactly close permanently go through a, a change in management, a change in ownership. And, and in those situations, we think uh, 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 the people who have staffed those hotels have a chance, deserve a chance to keep their jobs. And we want to make sure 
that they have that through this legislation. So, so yes, absolutely. It's been a concern pre-COVID and it's even more of a concern now. I appreciate that. And I want to pass it on to Council Member Chen. I'll just make the point that you said, if we had this problem in better times, we're facing now what could be an unprecedented wave of change in ownership and management. And so the time is now to put in protection so that workers aren't the ones that get hurt with when and if that happens. Uh, thank you for testifying. And uh, thank you. I'll pass it on to Council Member Chen. Thank you, everybody. Go ahead, Council Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair Cohen. And uh, thank you, it's good to see you, Bob. Um, I agree with Councilmember Levine. You know, this is so important to make sure that good paying quality jobs uh, in the hotel industry for our workers are protected. Um, one issue I have in terms of the bill um, is the service, is for the consumer part, the service interruption. Um, some of it is kind of broad and especially the part about construction. I mean, I could you know, see service interruption if there's construction going on inside the hotel. But like for my district in Lower Manhattan, there's constant construction going on on the streets or neighboring building. And I just wanna make sure that, um, that it doesn't, you know, affect um, the revenues for the hotel. Because I know that we have gotten contacted, um, you know, by hotel management to see how we can help uh, with overnight uh, constructions and things like that. So I just, just want to make sure that we, uh, you know, uh, minimize the negative impact um, on the hotel itself, uh, because we also want to make sure that they don't lessen their revenue. I want to make sure that hey, workers need their job. Um, so I think that part we might have to take a look at in terms of, you know, service interruption and make sure that it it doesn't you know, negatively impact in terms of the revenues for the hotel itself. So, so to that, I'd say that thank, thank you for that. I, I, I'd just say that our, it, it certainly doesn't serve us as the representative for the hotel workers to promote a policy that would uh, potentially put even more um, undue strain on, on our employers and prevent them from, from coming back to at least the levels of success they were seeing before the pandemic hit so so we wouldn't seek to do that and we do support that legislation because we believe it'll you know the hotels will operate as better businesses and and ultimately will um will attract more business and hopefully more international business from people who are otherwise perhaps a little uh reluctant to travel post covid so so that's our, our position is where we are in support of that part of the law as well yeah i just want to make sure that going forward we can you know have more clarification so that it's, it's, it's very, you know, concise. As I said, it's not just in my district, in other districts, especially in Manhattan, there's constant, you know, construction noise and things going on. So I, I just wanted to raise that concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Chen. As I see no more raised hands, we'll move on to the next witness. I have Troy Flanagan, followed by Richard Bourne, um, and followed by Tatiana Bijar. Troy, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Good, af good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chairman and, count and committee members. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to speak today. I wanted to speak about intro 2049, and uh, certainly thank you for your time. Um, I actually want to echo uh, several of the uh, statements that have been made uh, in, in discussing the, the need for um, legislation in this area. Uh, the, the time, the, we're in unprecedented, unprecedented economic times in, in the hospitality industry. Um, four out of 10 hotel workers are still off the job across the country. Uh, while we're seeing slightly encouraging national unemployment figures, it's not really getting any better within the lodging space. And now that the summer travel season is over, we expect it to go, get even worse. Um, just uh, a, a, an additional data point, just uh, in the last couple hours, the occupancy data for the week of August 30th were released and comparing the week of August 30th this year versus last year for New York City, in 2019, the occupancy rate for New York City was 87.4%. Last week, it was 38.2%. So I say all that uh, to, to, to focus my comments that anything that 
that we can do collectively and the city council should, could do uh, to, to help workers and the economy should be focused solely on that at this moment in time. Um, I think part of this bill does address the welfare of workers and the change in ownership. Um, but I think the provisions, the subsection related to uh, service disruptions uh, are, are less related and have, uh, they're overly broad as has been stated and have uh, a great potential if not narrowed or clarified to actually discourage and dissuade travel to New York City. And, that, and that's how we're gonna get out of this. Um, AHLA um, and, and many of the hotel, large hotel brands and independent properties have created uh, new programs to re reinforce the levels of cleanliness and cleanliness and safety that are being put into hotels because no one's going to travel and no one's going to go back to work in a hotel unless they feel clean and safe to do so. And so that is the number one priority. And I think that we should focus, focus this conversation on ways that we can protect workers and get hotels back up and running to safely welcome guests uh, and workers. Um, I, I think that there are, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement and perhaps a separate conversation with regard to uh, the service disruption provisions of the bill. And so I would uh, look forward to uh, continuing a conversation with, with the sponsor uh, and, and co-sponsors about how we could perhaps uh, narrow that or even decouple these two conversations because I, I think they uh, go in, into kind of di different directions. One is uh, uh, clearly much more urgent than the other. So with that, I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions. I don't see any questions. Chair, do you have any questions? With that, we'll move on to Richard Bourne. Ri Richard, we can't hear you. I don't think you have audio. Well, Keith, I'm sorry, I was muted, but I was here. I just wanted to, uh, that I did hear the testimony and I understood the point. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Richard Bourne. Uh, I am a principal in BD Hotels. We own and operate hotels in the city of New York. Um, and I'm not sure that many of my statements are going to be very popular listening to everybody, but I just feel a need to voice some concerns. Um, we are experiencing unprecedented times, a disaster for both labor and ownership. Tens of thousands of hotel workers have been furloughed. And one third of hotels in New York City are in default of their loans. Two thirds are probably underwater. Many, many of these hotels will disappear. Probably somewhere between 150 and 200 hotels will, are, will remain closed forever with the loss of tens of thousands of jobs, permanent losses. These two bills will result in the exacerbation of this trend. It'll result in more hotels permanently closing and it will result in more jobs permanently lost. In addition, it will prevent the rebuilding or inhibit the rebuilding of the industry, the replacement of hotels and the replacement of jobs over the course of time as the city and the industry recovers. Um, the two parts of 2049 um, both create problems of their own. Um, in particular, the worker retention portion lays the obligation of future owners of rehiring under existing conditions a, a, a staff. This is something that banks around the world universally uh, try to run from. If hotels are not financeable, if hotels cannot be developed, if hotels cannot be maintained, if banks shun from the industry, there will be no industry and there'll be less hotels and there'll be less hotel jobs. The consumer protection portion of it in the time of COVID makes no sense. The idea that any picket can result in 
the, the requirement of a hotel to send notices out to all its potential customers is, sets up a system where fraud can be rampant. Anybody can pick it. Anybody can organize a picket and anybody can hold a hotel hostage for the threat of a picket. The idea that, uh, that, that you know, hotels were, are a service business. Hotels operate successfully because they keep their customers happy. Those that don't end up not being successful. It's like any other business. It's like a restaurant. It's like a retail store. It's like a dry cleaners. If you treat your customers badly, you won't have customers. Hotels are, most, are among the most reviewed service business. Every customer goes online, every customer checks TripAdvisor to check the quality of the hotels and the reviews by guests. We are, we are self-regulated industry and it happens to work because I think most people have good experiences. At a time where a third of the hotels are going under and another third rapidly going after that, this is not a time to put another nail in the coffin of the industry that will create a disaster both for ownership and a disaster for labor and will cost the city tens of thousands of jobs and will cost the city millions, if not billions in tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We have oh, a final, yes. I just, um, I, I don't know if, uh, if you object to the aim of the worker protection portion of the bill or just the, the drafting. Could you clarify that for me? Well, you know, the, the, clearly I don't, I don't object to the aim. I think the important thing is to understand what is a losing game, what is a zero sum game, and what, what is a positive game. There is nothing in the legislation that's gonna create more jobs. So the legislation gives an avenue for existing workers to maintain a position for a period of time while they're reviewed. What it does is it shackles the banks because the banks don't want to be in a position where they legislatively have to become employers. They don't need, they don't want to be in it. They don't, you know, liability is the one thing they care about. A bank will make a loan and their last resort is to take back the real estate and take back an operating business. And the one thing a bank doesn't want to hear is they don't want to hear, these are your employees, you must retain them all, and you must pay them full salary, and you must sit down you know, and, and, and bargain with their bargaining agents. It, it, it will be a chilling effect. You know, I'm not sure when the, I have very little political experience. When the council proposes a bill like, like this, with these two aspects, do they sit down with industry groups? Do they hire consulting companies to say, what is the ramification of this bill? This is, you know, these are bills that affect tens of thousands of people, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of commerce and tens of millions of dollars of New York City tax dollars, of occupancy taxes, sales taxes, real estate taxes. Has that, does anyone study this or is it a good idea? If you, but if you support the aim of the bill, um, and, and understand that, that the goal, you know, I'm not the sponsor of the bill, the prime sponsor, but the goal of the legislation is also is to prevent a race to the bottom in terms of employees in the industry and, and promote some stability for the, for the employees. Uh, uh, do you think that there's a workaround to the problem of financing that you suggested? Well, I, I mean, I think the workaround is, you know, in any particular hotel, we could deal with an industry, you could deal with a, with a hotel. Uh, at some point in time, that hotel is either a viable operation or not a viable operation. If it's a viable operation, it's going to retain the majority of its labor force. If it doesn't retain the majority of the labor force, it may be substituting portions of the labor force. If the hotel is not viable, then it's going to go away. The biggest threat to the labor force in New York City is hotels going away. If a, you know, if a hotel is, you know, is simply not solvent, if it's simply not a, a concern that can, that can be ongoing, then the only result will be another piece of real estate, because that's what the hotel underlies the hotel. 
There is no piece of real estate that employs more people than a, than a hotel, 10 times as many per square foot as an apartment house or an office building. So the, the number one goal for anybody interested in jobs and employment in the city of New York, it's making these hotels viable. And these, and these two bills simply cost hotels money. And if they cost hotels money, either in terms of valuation in, from the lending community or in terms of a pain in the neck and having to send notifications to all your guests all the time, every time your toilets get stuffed, it just makes it less viable. If it's less viable, there are less hotels, there are less jobs. That's the bottom line for these two bills. Are there workarounds to make them better? Of course there are. But, but just as they're written right now, these two bills will, call, will result in less New York City hospitality employment and less employment total. That's a fact. No work around that. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? I don't see any other raised hands. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. The next and last witness is Tatiana Bajar. Tatiana, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of our membership who are uh, domestic employers. My name is Tatiana Bejar and I am the New York City lead organizer at Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network. Hand in Hand is a national network of employers, of nannies, house cleaners and home attendants, our families and allies. We support domestic employers to improve their employment practices through education, advocacy and organizing. We believe that dignified and respectful working conditions benefit both workers and employers alike. There are around 2.7 million people who hire a domestic worker in New York State. Hundreds of thousands are in New York City. And although the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights that passed in New York State 2010 was a great step forward to advance working conditions, still thousands of domestic workers continue working in the shadows and are exposed to different types of labor abuses and discrimination. Domestic workers have been some of the hardest hit workers by the pandemic. They are also essential workers who have continued caring for our families and loved ones, like seniors, people with disabilities and children. Domestic workers are currently only entitled to three paid sick days under the law, and this is definitely inadequate in the midst of this pandemic. Hand in Hand strongly supports the update of the New York City's paid safe and uh, sick leave law to extend 40 hours of paid sick time to our city's domestic workers. Domestic employers understand that their lives are interdependent with the people that work in their homes and want to do the right thing to create fair and healthy workplaces. Hand in Hand plays a central role in providing guidance on fair employment practices through written resources and webinars to domestic employers. One of our core recommendations is to provide at least one week of basic leave. Many employers follow these recommendations because they realize the current three days provided by the law isn't nearly enough to create a fair and healthy work environment in their homes. However, every day people become domestic employers and it's impossible for us to reach every employer in the city. The government must take action to set the standards for workplaces that exist in people's homes. This includes a stronger basic leave law that requires domestic employers to provide the same sick leave protections as every other employer in the city. We strongly urge New York City Council to update the current basic leave law and applaud the council for taking leadership in this issue and thank the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for hearing our testimony as to why this bill should pass and become effective immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Chair, do you have any questions? I do not. Great. Um, at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the raise hand function. As I do not see any raised hands, I'll pass it on to the chair to give closing remarks and to gavel out. Thank you. 
Well, in case I just want to make sure I acknowledged all the members. There were no other members to. I don't see any other members. Let me double check. Nope. Everyone's been acknowledged. All right. This concludes this hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. Uh, I want to thank the staff. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, as always, there was a lot of work uh, to try to prepare for today's hearing. And I feel in some ways the work uh, multiplies, even though we're doing it virtually. Um, and uh, the participation, I think, is even though the participation was uh, not overwhelming today, uh, but uh, I think we've made the city council somehow more accessible, even though it's uh, virtual. So uh, I want to thank all the staff and everybody who uh, makes this hearing possible. Um, and uh, uh, this concludes the hearing. Thank you very much.